Let's see. The way I've always described the movie is a Three Stooges movie directed by Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> of course, the perfect woman's not just gonna walk into my life. <laughs> the first day of filming, I had to do a take where my tie flew up and went woo like that. So I thought, all right, I know what this is. I, this is, there's no mistaking what this is. <laughs> I always wanted to be an actor uh, ever since I could remember, so I'm not quite sure what started it. I think I went to see The Wonders of Aladdin with Donald O'Connor when I was about five, and I thought, that's what I want to do. But that might be just something I made up later, I'm not sure. But I knew I wanted to live in New York, so that's where I uh, came at when I left college and, uh, and have stayed. So everything I've gotten, I've pretty much gotten from New York. So mostly plays, I would say, being a New York actor. I thought I wanted to play everything, and, I, and I've been pretty lucky to play lots of different things. But I, I think I probably uh, play mostly uh, sort of um, grieving, sad, middle-aged white men. Back in the day, uh, when Crime Wave was made, I was playing lots of uh, sort of sensitive boy next door type of parts, uh, you know, and, and goofy. But it was, it was mostly just sort of callow youth is what I, was, I would say I was mostly playing back then. Oh. <laughs> oh, um, would you like to have some lunch some evening? I first heard about uh, uh, XYZ Murders is what it was first called. I was out on a date with my girlfriend and I got a phone call when I got home uh, to call the casting director, Barbara Clayman. Urgent. She called three or four times. It was on the answering machine. And uh, I called her back. It was 11.30 at night and she said, there's this movie happening in Detroit. It's called The XYZ Murders. Yeah, I thought, hmm. And it's directed by Sam Raimi, who just had a hit with The Evil Dead. Ooh, I thought, that doesn't sound very, it sounds kind of gory and trashy. Uh, she said, it's the lead in a movie read. And I was like, okay. She needed me to fly out to Detroit the next morning at 6.15. Because what had happened, and this is a little known story that uh, I think our fans would be interested in. Another actor had been cast as Vic. And uh, he lived in L.A. and he was incredibly excited about playing Vic. And he took a bottle of champagne over to the L.A. casting director's house to celebrate. And when he showed up, uh, the casting lady and her boyfriend were having a big knockdown drag out fight. And the big scary boyfriend punched him and broke his cheekbone. Oh! So he was out and they needed somebody. This was like three days before filming was to begin. So I literally flew out uh, to Detroit, met with Sam, and he said, you're it. I flew home to New York, packed a bag, and flew out the next day to start filming in Detroit. And our first day of filming was Halloween uh, 1983. Call me a sport. I'd call you a heel. So I'm a heel. So what up? I think I knew that Bruce was supposed to play Vic and there was, there was some drama around it. Um, but Bruce, I will say, was so nice to me and a complete gentleman. All of them were. I mean, looking back on it, there was probably enormous resentment that s the studio was making them use somebody else. Um, and, I, you know, I don't really know why it was me. I had done one other movie before called Four Friends, directed by Arthur Penn, but that had been a couple of years earlier. I think Susan Tarr, who was uh, one of the producers, uh, was a fan of Four Friends and, and recommended me, and Barbara Clayman, who was the casting person that called me, was a fan. So I think that's how I got in there. And I, and I went, as soon as I met Sam, I thought, this is, uh, this is a part I could do. I mean, uh, it felt up my alley. Come here. Come here. Come here. Look at this guy. <laughs> Come here. Yeah. Sam is such, or was then, such a decent, great guy. Um, you know, just a goofball. And uh, everybody was goofballs. And it was kind of, they were kind of thrilled at the notion of 
getting to make a studio movie. Um, I admired him enormously and uh, was so, I had a feeling that something great was going to happen with him, certainly, and of course it did. He was very clear about what he wanted this to be and the kind of film he wanted to make and the kind of movies he wanted to make. That's it. So I like those schmooze, really schmooze, but it needs to come back. <laughs> the comeback schmooze. We had a funny little studio where some things were built, which was not intended to be a soundstage at all. So it was incredibly not soundproof. And, but they had uh, constructed uh, the apartment in there and the, the house of doors and those things. Um, so it was cold, it was winter. We filmed from Halloween until the end of January, I believe. There was a scene that was cut from the movie. The, the, and it, sort of amazingly, I was on a plane years later watching Spider-Man 2. I wasn't even watching it, I just saw the picture. There was a whole fight in the subway, uh, the underground, that the studio made them cut. And it was recycled into Spider-Man 2. It was the exact same sequence. So I thought, well, nothing's, nothing was, is wasted with Sam. Um, so that became the fight on the Belle Isle Bridge in Detroit which we filmed in the freezing cold. And then the last scene, which was cut before they added the wraparound of, the, of Death Row, uh, I fell off the bridge and landed in the water. And uh, Nancy then comes and drags me out and we have a happy ending by the river. And uh, that was filmed on location in the freezing cold. I had a wetsuit on. Um, it was a pretty miserable cold shoot, but fun. We had a really good time. I think things could have been a lot worse. My memory is that we were a fairly happy group. Cherie and I, I thought, got along really well. Um, she had maybe done one other thing. She was mostly a model. Uh, she looked like Grace Kelly to me, so it was, you know, easy to fall in love with her. And she was lots of fun and a good sport and up for anything. So it was, she was great. Um, and we had an awfully good time. Brian and Paul um, scared me a little bit, uh, though they were always nice. I think I was scared of Paul because he was the scary Turkish guy in Midnight Express, which I'd already seen. and. I think he was happy to have me be scared of him. <laughs> I didn't really hang out with him very much. He had a really nice wife, uh, and she was lovely. She was about, she came up to his knee. Um, and uh, Brian was, uh, you know, a nice guy, a tortured guy. Um, I remember when he tore up his hotel room he got high and some, there was some horrible incident and Bruce writes about this in his book uh, and I think it was just things were already tough and then suddenly he was acting like a rock star. There might have been a little wish fulfillment on Brian's part I think you know that he wanted to be the guy that could tear up the hotel room or maybe not maybe he just really was tortured and and went wild and uh, and did that. He was always very nice to me um, and I never felt unsafe in our fights or things like that, though he was clearly a very tortured guy. Louise Lasser, I liked enormously. She, uh, you know, she was a superstar in my mind, Mary Hartman and Woody Allen's wife, and, you know, so I just couldn't believe that I was getting back with her, and she was really funny. We all, we all, you know, loved Sam and wanted to uh, please him. You know, we really knew he was the real deal. <laughs> The finale, the car chase, and the bridge fight both were really hard uh, because, as I say, working on the Belle Isle Bridge, which we did for a good deal of the actual fight, um, it was so cold and I couldn't have a coat and I couldn't have a wetsuit or long johns or anything because my pants were all ripped, you had to see my skin. Um, and then I'd never done a fight scene before. And also because of the shoestring budget, it felt a little bit thrown together. Like I wouldn't have, it wasn't the most 
uh, well thought out. I'm sure on Transformers they have a much larger budget to make all that stuff work. But I think that's part of the charm is that it's just so on the fly and goofy. <laughs> There was clearly some drama going on with the studio. Um, I knew this mostly because this sequence in the subway, which would have cost a fortune, um, was cut. And I feel like there were lots of conversations about going over budget and um, Sam was in the hot seat about that. And, and though he never shared it with me directly, I feel like I observed lots of powwows and brow scratching and things of as, as they were talking to people. But Ed Pressman, who was uh, also a producer and in the movie, uh, I think was really a champion for Sam and Rob and um, was doing everything he could. I never felt like he was the bad guy. Um, but I feel like it was the whole thing, like the studio, this was my sense, never really had much faith in it. And then what happened afterwards is Sam edited it for about a year. That was when they said you need the framing device of the electric chair stuff. So that was all filmed a year later. That was in the fall of 1984 um, that we all reconvened in Los Angeles. There's a standing set of a, a death row, a jailhouse thing that we, we went on. I don't have any idea where it was. But we all sort of reconvened a year later to do this thing. And Sam was fairly cheerful. At the, at the reshoots, but I'm sure now, looking back on it, he must have been miserable. But again, was very, very discreet about his feelings about it. Oh, hold it, hold it! It's the governor! Am I too late? No, governor. Oh, I didn't want to miss this. I find with movies that there, the experience of making the movie is very different than the movie itself that when you see the movie, it's like the greatest home movie in the world because you're like, I remember the day we filmed that scene, that was so much fun. So it's hard to be objective about the movie itself. But uh, when we initially finished, I thought, this could be great. Uh, but then it took so long and all the drama about the editing and everything that I think I finally got fairly depressed about it. Uh, interestingly, weirdly, uh, when the movie opened in 1985, I had become so depressed about my career and my thing in show business, and Crime Wave had a little bit to do with it, I actually took a year and moved to France. Uh, I took a year off from show business, and the first day I was in Paris waiting for my key, the one person I knew in Paris was a guy I'd gone to high school with who ran Columbia Pictures. And in this little tabac, I called him up and I said, I'm here, I'm waiting for my key. He said, did you make a movie called Crime Wave? I said, yeah, it's bad, and I'm really bad in it. I'm like a teenage Jerry Lewis. It's bad. He said, well, it's about to open here in a month. Do you want to do press for it? And I said, sure. So my first month of my year off from show business, I was a movie star and giving interviews and going to film festivals and doing all this stuff. Met some amazing French people because of it. The movie opened and failed. It was called Mort sur la Grille, with Death on the Grill was the French title. Um, and it lasted a week and was gone, but I had made all these wonderful friends. So I have, am very grateful to Crime Wave for starting my year off from show business in such a great way. Don't have much savvy in the ways of the world. I don't know much. Crime Wave was a blast to do. I got to be the star of the movie, which was, you know, I never did that before. I'm not sure I've done it since. And um, I love that it's this cult movie. Um, I, and I've shown it to my teenage son who loves it. And so, you know, it's all good. Um, I, I was thrilled to have done it at the time. And, uh, you know, 30 years later, I'm thrilled to be in it. I was a woman who could take care of me.